So as was mentioned at the top of the service, today is Transfiguration Sunday. And of course, then our gospel text covered the story of Jesus' transfiguration. The transfiguration is a strange event, much of it beyond understanding. I mean, there's some callback to the stories in the Old Testament where we can maybe say, oh, that one's kind of like this one in terms of the story that, that Phyllis read today. But really, just imagine the transfiguration story on its own where you have no knowledge of the Old Testament. So here's my recap of it anyway. So Jesus, Peter, and John went up a mountain and suddenly Jesus was, quote, transfigured before them. His clothes became bright white and shone like the sun. And then, out of nowhere, two ghosts of Israel's past appeared. Moses, who freed the Israelites, and Elijah, a prophet. And they just start talking with Jesus. It doesn't reveal what they talked about, which would be nice, but no. Instead, Peter, who must have been a nervous talker, felt that he should say something into this moment. He just started yammering to make sense of this seemingly psychedelic episode. So he blurted, Lord, it's good for us to be here. I will make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. No one even acknowledges what Peter said. At that point, it's almost comical. Instead, what happened next is a bright cloud rolls in, and of course, the bright cloud starts talking. The cloud said, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So that's an interesting plot twist. A bright cloud rolls in, and the bright cloud is Jesus' father. After that, the disciples are so overwhelmed by the scene, they fall to the ground, perhaps implying that they fainted. Jesus helped them up, told them not to worry. They looked around, the ghosts were gone, and the cloud was gone. And they started to walk down the mountain, and Jesus was like, hey, don't tell anybody about this until after Easter. The disciples had no idea what Easter even was at that point. What in the world is this story? The whole sequence sounds like the dreams that I have when I'm on NyQuil. And if this story leaves you confused, I assure you that you are not alone. One New Testament scholar affirms, a scholar on the Gospel of Matthew, no less, for modern readers, the story of the transfiguration of Jesus is one of the most difficult. And I would add, that this event is not only difficult for us modern readers, because clearly the disciples who witnessed it seemed pretty confused too. I mean, Peter tried to speak to the moment, but apparently he was so off base with his words that they weren't even given a direct response. <laughs> Meanwhile, the other disciples were speechless until they fainted. What was Peter even trying to say anyway? build three tents, three dwellings? To be fair to Peter, I think he was trying to honor the moment with his Old Testament understandings. He saw Moses and Elijah with Jesus, these big hitters of Israel's history, and Peter wanted to commemorate the occasion. We should build something here. But rather than discussing that, God's response to the cloud interrupted Peter. It says, while he was still talking. I love that. The cloud interrupts Peter and says, This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. It's almost as if to say, Chill out, Peter. Stop talking. This is all you need to know. So for us modern people, hearing this wild story, perhaps trying to figure out the Rubik's Cube of it, the same needs to be said and is being said to us. 
But of course, if you're anything like me, you witness the transfiguration story and you're like, wait, how, why, why did the, co- the clothes change colors? Why did they change colors? God spoke through a cloud? I wonder what language God spoke in. Was it really loud? Did people at the bottom of the mountain hear it? Was it, what did Moses and Elijah and Jesus actually talk about? God, do you still speak through clouds? And then the divine voice interrupts that wondering, as holy as it is, and says, chill out. This is my son, the beloved, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. That's all you need to know. That's all we need to know. Just like Jesus' baptism affirms Jesus' identity, so does this transfiguration. So outside of that, there's not a lot we can sort out here. But I will say this. The context of the transfiguration in the broader story of Jesus is worth noting. Because where this happens in the Gospels is important. Because the transfiguration story marks a significant turning point in his ministry on earth. And that's why it marks a significant turning point in our seasons of the church. We go from Epiphany to Lent. On that point, I don't know how many of you play golf, but in golf there are 18 holes in the round broken up into the front nine and the back nine. Golfers call this halfway point the turn or the point where you go to the clubhouse to sulk about what just happened on the front nine, hoping you could salvage something on the back nine only to yank one into the trees on the 10th, on the 10th tee. But I digress. Perhaps one way to think of and understand the context of the transfiguration is to think of this moment as the turn in Jesus' ministry. He's finished the front nine of his work and is about to hit the back nine. The transfiguration is the turn. Now he heads towards Jerusalem where he will arrive on Palm Sunday. So two basic points for you today. The transfiguration affirms who Jesus is and it marks a critical turning point in his ministry. In affirming who he is, the transfiguration is a confirming moment again of his identity and his authority, his belovedness and his sonship. In other words, again, God is repeating. This isn't just another rabbi. This isn't just another prophet. This isn't just another teacher. Take what he says and what he's about to do very seriously. And the transfiguration is a turning point for Jesus where he heads down the mountain to finish what he has started. And that's important to note. Jesus could have stayed up there. He could have stayed at the top of that mountain in safety and security and at least a worldly understanding of glory. He could have taken Peter's advice and set up camp, but he didn't. He didn't stay on that mountain and chum it up with Israel's big hitters and build a little shrine to himself as if it was all about him. He came back down to earth to and for his people. And that's consistently his nature, to come down from on high and into the broken and suffering world that needs him. He came down to finish his business because this is not an end point. It's a turning point, the back nine. And what is the end of Jesus' course? For what finally was he affirmed? What exactly will be the end point? We will soon find out. We'll soon find out what he does for the love and redemption of all creation. My friends, here ends Epiphany. As one professor would say, from the Mount of the Transfiguration, we head now to the Mount of the Cross. And the season of Lent begins. Amen.